Well, I'm going to be, I'm not used to these glasses yet, so you're going to see me take them off and on quite a few times before the day's up, before the night's over with. All right, so uh, tonight we're going to start with the book of Malachi. Um, I had never really done much of a study with the book of Malachi. Um, my wife uh, suggested that I take a look at it, and I'm glad she did, because it's a, it's a really good book, and I think we can... Uh, uh, or at least I feel like I learned a lot that I can uh, apply to my life. And uh, hopefully we can uh, share something together that, that we can all learn from. All right, before we begin, would you please bow with me in prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have together to, uh, to study your word and to, to learn from the message that you wanted us to, uh, to have at our disposal, Father. Father, I ask that we uh, take these uh, lessons that we learned tonight and we apply them to our lives. And uh, most importantly, we uh, use these in order to reach out to others and to show them your grace and your love, Father. Praise your Son's holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, so Malachi is in the Old Testament. It is the uh, final, I don't know if it's the last one written. Is it the last one written? Chronologically speaking, I'm not really sure about that. It's uh, but there was a it was the right before the long silence, right before the the New Testament times, and Jesus came and uh, John the Baptist uh, roamed the earth. And I think it's actually predicted a little bit in this uh, in Malachi, but I'm not sure we'll really get that far. Okay, so if you'll follow along with me, I'm going to read Malachi verses one through five, chapter one, verses one through five. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and let his heritage, left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down. And they, uh, they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. So what is it about Esau that God would say here that he hated Esau. We are always talking, so I try to <laughs> Oh, we're good. Go ahead. It, um, Esau despised his birthright. Okay. So that is actually. That is, that is one of the things that I wrote down. That's actually the first thing I wrote down, actually. So um, let's take a look at Genesis chapter 25. We're going to do a little bit of jumping around because Malachi actually touches on a lot of yes. concepts that are throughout the Scriptures. Genesis chapter 25. All right, here we go. Uh, 29 through 34. If you'll follow along with me. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob, Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, or excuse me, lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, despise there doesn't necessarily mean hated, right? Didn't esteem it. Didn't esteem it. That's actually. I'm glad you said that because that word is going to come very much important later on. That's one of the main reasons that um, that God hated Esau. Because, and, and keep in mind as we're moving on, that when, when God says He hated Esau, He's not just talking about Esau, right? He's talking about 
the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. And, and, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that here in just a little bit. And he kind of talked about it also when he's talking about how uh, their land was going to be jackals and, and all kinds of bad things. Because obviously Esau wasn't around at that time, right? So, so that was the first thing, is that he had no um, respect or esteem for the fact that he was the firstborn. So let's, let's skip over to 27, 1 through 4. And this is the, it's, it's following the same basic story um, with, between Esau, or Isaac and Esau and Jacob. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here, I'm, here. Oh, that's my son, sorry. Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day uh, of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, uh, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now I'm going to stop there for a second. And it, is it my imagination, or does it seem like Isaac is unaware that Esau no longer has the birthright? I think Esau never even bothered mentioning it. It didn't concern him at all. Right. He was. Well, there was no reason for him to uh, come and talk to his father and say, "Look, yeah, I'm so my birthright." Right. I think that's absolutely. I mean, to me, Isaac would not be talking about giving him the the, the what well, the blessing is the birthright. Right. Now we'll talk about this in a little bit. But what was the prediction given to Rebecca? about who would serve whom right the younger would serve the older and that's that's part of my lesson later on so i don't want to dig into that too much except to say that i wonder if abraham was aware uh, abraham i'm sorry isaac was aware of that prediction and th and did that necessarily mean that that esau was going to be giving up his birthright necessarily i I'm not sure if that's what was prediction, if God knew that that was going to happen and predicted it. But I will, I will say this, that to me it's clear when I read this that, that Isaac was expecting to give him his birthright, his um, blessing. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Jimmy. We know from Scripture that God was the one that intended for Jacob to be the, the heir so that it wouldn't, the descendancy of Christ would not be based on man but upon God's selection. God's, so God put all that in place. And, I, and I've got that in here, and we'll, we will get to that. I'm glad you, you're jumping ahead of me, but I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Okay, so so that was, uh, that was the point I wanted to make on that, which was that um, Isaac at that point apparently did not know that Esau was not supposed to get the, the blessing, but it was supposed to be um, Jacob. Uh, Genesis 27, uh, 26 through 30. And I know I'm moving through this real quick because uh, I don't want to get bogged down. Uh, looking at verse 26, Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord is blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven, and of the uh, fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine let people serve you and nations bow down to you be lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you uh, as soon as ja as soon as isaac had finished blessing jacob when jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of isaac his father esau his brother came in uh, from his hunting now that had to be an interesting moment. Uh, let me see. All right. So that was the main thing that I wanted to talk about as far as, as the first reason why um, he was hated by God because he despised his birthright. Uh, what, was it, what was another reason that God would have despised Esau? Say again. 
Um, so this, the second thing that, that come to my mind was that Esau planned to kill Jacob. So if you'll take a look at Genesis chapter uh, 27, verse uh, 41. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with, it just, with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, then I will kill my brother Jacob. So that's 10, uh, 27, verse 41. So moving forward from that, though, I'm going to look, start looking at more of the Edomites. So... Now this one I had, yes ma'am. Oh, I didn't need to stop you. Oh, okay. So with the Edomites, they actually had an encounter with the Hebrews in the wilderness. Do y'all remember that? And that was one of the things that, that I would say would have made God hate them. So look at Numbers 20, verses 14 through 20. Yes ma'am. Before you move on, can I bring something else in mind? Absolutely. Um, Esau also married uh, non-Hebrew women. That's true. And and that really the Canaanites, uh, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing that from memory. But anyway, yes, continue. Yeah, he married non-Hebrew women, the pagan women, and that really uh, uh, did not sit well with his mother. Mm -mm. And she actually went to Isaac, her husband, and say, um, the women that. Uh, What's his name, Mary? Uh, Esau married. Anyway, it didn't make her feel good. No. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't really dig into that, so okay. I don't. Another problem, another problem. I don't want to chase that rabbit just because I'm afraid I'd go down the wrong hole. <laughs> but um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, uh, Numbers chapter 20. Uh, Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 20. Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 20. So Moses sent uh, messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the hardship that we have met. How our fathers went down to Egypt and we lived in Egypt a, a long time and the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh. Uh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand uh, or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, You shall not pass through, lest I come out with a sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, uh, we will go up by the highway, and if we drink of your water, I and my stock, uh, livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. So once again, this time when they had a chance to treat them as family at least at the very least allow them to travel through their lands the edomites would not allow that to happen and so they rejected the jews or the hebrews um, at that time so and it, it didn't end there the edomites continued to hate israel now if you want to uh, if you don't mind turn to obadiah I promise, I think that I'm, I'm getting near the end of these examples. But Obadiah is another good excerpt that takes a look at um, at, at how they treated the, the Israels, the Ju Judah. Hang on a second. That's a small book. I'm going to keep passing over it. Okay, I'm going to read it from here. All right, so uh, Obadiah, verses 1 through 14. This I'm, I'm reading now from the New King James Version. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the, says the Lord concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let's, let us rise up against her for battle. So that's Edom saying that about trying to, trying to um, stir up trouble for Israel. Sorry. Um, 
Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. Uh, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. Uh, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off, would they not have stolen till they had enough? I'm going to pause it for a second. What does he mean by that? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? Yeah, it's, it's like he's saying, if the robbers had come and robbed you, they would have taken what they wanted and then left. But that's not what the Edomites were doing. The Edomites wanted to take everything. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's not just that they wanted to take from the Jews, they wanted to take everything from the Jews. Um, if great gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleamings? And would they not have left something behind? Um, oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasure shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Uh, those, excuse me, those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Teman, I know I said that wrong, but uh, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For violence against your brother Jacob, uh, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that the that strangers carried captive uh, forces. Okay, so I'm not going to read all of that. But the point is, is that clearly there was a lot going on and that, and that the Edomites were really stirring up a lot of trouble for... Say again? For his brother Right, for his brother uh, Jacob. Um... So, Jody pointed this out, and so we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 9, verse 6 through 13. Because Paul is dealing with this a little bit. I hope I said that right. In Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 13, you know, in the early church, there's always the, the, the like little conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul, I thought, really did a good job of, of bringing it home how they were all one family, right? And that the Jews really had no advantage over the, the Gentiles. And here he's talking about it again. He says, but it is not, but it is not that the word of God has taken no, F, no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called... That is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of words, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. Now I'm going to stop there for just a second. Very important point. God did not hate Esau at this point. Neither of them had done anything good or evil. God had chosen Jacob, the younger, at the very least, he has stated that the younger will serve the older. But it was predicted that way um, by God. And God loved, I mean, we know that God loves us all, right? And God does not hate somebody who hasn't had a chance to sin. But even, even here it says, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Jody wants to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> I can see it. And the term hated... 
in our modern thinking is, is one way. What it really is saying is Jacob I love, Esau I love less. Okay, that's an excellent point. I'm going to repeat it for the folks online. Is that, that hated doesn't necessarily mean hated like um, I hate asparagus. It's, <laughs> it's hated like I love asparagus less than broccoli. But I don't know why I'm thinking food. I'm sorry. <laughs> you would think I wouldn't be thinking food right now. But that, that's, that's an excellent point, is that, is that it, it's not necessarily hated in the sense of um, wanting to see them die. Uh-oh. Excuse me a second. I left my good notebook at home, so if I lose my computer, y'all just have to listen to me just read the Bible, which is not bad. Amen. <laughs> sorry. All right. So, um, but... I want to get back to the point that I was trying to make. And then Jacob. So, God's hatred of Esau goes back to not He loved Esau left because he gave him. Right. But Esau's conduct is what actually led to God's bringing judgment against him. That is exactly what I was getting at. I know I went all the way around the road in Mulberry Bush to get there. But that's where I was going with all of this, is that God did not hate Esau because he hated Esau. He hated Esau because of the choices that he made. And, and not just Esau, but the Edomites. The choices that they made. It was those choices that they made that brought them into a poor relationship with God the Father. So thank you. All right. We got there quicker than I thought we would. All right. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and read this, even though I know you already got the point. But in Galatians 6, 7 through 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he sows to his flesh. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So that's the point that I was trying to drive home is that it's man's behavior that really determines the relationship between man and God because God gave us that avenue and opportunity to have a personal, a close personal relationship with God. And I was, I don't want to get ahead of myself too much. But I'm going to stop for a second. Yes, ma'am. Brother, that last passage that you read in Romans. The one I just read? Romans. Romans. Yes. The Romans 9, I believe. That mm -hmm. was, I'm kind of missing something. What would that passage? Romans 9, 6 through 13. Oh, 6. Okay, gotcha, brother. 6 through 13, Romans 9. You're going to make me doubt myself. I'm going to have to look. And, and, and the other one you just read was what now? Galatians 6. 7 through 18. 6, 7 through 18. 7 through, seven through 8, excuse me. 7 through 8. Not a problem. 7 Not through 8. Track. Okay, all right. Now, I got to get back on track. Okay, so, uh, uh, okay, that was it. Is that, is that we can find ourselves in that same loss of relationship with God if we're not careful. If we're, and I don't mean careful like, because I know we have the grace, right? God's grace. But we also can, if we allow ourselves, fall from that grace. And we can lose that relationship. But that relationship that gets lost is not because God, does that make sense? In other words, it's because we make choices and decisions that can cost us that. All right, so let's go back to Malachi. If y'all feel like we're hopping all over the place, I apologize. All right, so now this, this uh, I really enjoyed reading. Um, so I'm probably going to, to break it up a little bit more than, than what I did in my notes. So if you'll just bear with me. A son honors his father. Now, how often do you think father figure is used in the Old Testament in reference to God? Kind of surprised me when I when I started looking into it. It's more often than you'd realize, because, but in the New Testament, 
what was it that that you know it's more of a abba father it's more of a closer relationship it's more and that was because of jesus right he he, he tore down that veil that separation he made it to where we can have a more personal relationship with god and, and it'd be more of a father-son relationship and um whew, i wrote down all those awesome scriptures in my notebook and i and i left the notebook at home Okay, so we're not going to get to delve into that too deeply, except that I want to point out that in, in the Old Testament, the father figure of God is more of a, a disciplinarian, more of a, I am the master of this house, I am, you will respect me as your father, and a reverence and a fear almost. So it's, it's not that close personal relationship. I think David did. I, I wish I'd kept uh, my, my script, my verses with me. But David did mention um, him in more of a closer relationship in Psalms. Yes, ma'am. Brother, that scripture that may help with this mm -hmm. is Romans, the eighth chapter, uh, in the 15th verse. Romans, okay, let's take a look at that. Chapter, let's it take talks a look at about, uh, yeah. Romans the eighth chapter about Abba Father. Okay. Guess, yeah, about the fifteenth verse. Is that the one you was? Yes. Thank you. Uh, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery and fall uh, to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by sons, by whom we cr we cry Abba Father. And Abba, that word Abba is that close personal. Yeah. Uh, like Dad. Yeah. It's that it's that it's that personal is my understanding. I'm not a Amen. Greek uh, expert. Okay. Um let's see. Uh, nah, nah. All right. So that's the first thing is uh, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Uh, if then I am father, Amen. where is my honor? And if I am master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my, my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Remember, um, I'm glad you brought that up by despised. It's not saying hated. Really what they're saying is that they had no, no esteem, no value, no worth to it. It is meaningless to them. And here's how it was meaningless. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when, you're offer, excuse me, when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? So what were they giving? Not their best. Not their best. Matter of fact, not only not their best. They reject. Who said reject? Yes, ma'am. They're rejects. The stuff they wouldn't even give to their father. The stuff they would probably wouldn't give to their children. The stuff that was that, that, that they had no other use for. They couldn't sell it. They I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but they could not do anything with this. So why not just give it to give it? Throw it on the table. Throw it on God's offering table. Now. Yeah, I get goosebumps when I think about that. Do we do this? Do we give God our best? That's something I think that we can take from this right here. And 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 I'll draw, I wanted to make that point early because as we move into this deeper, then that's going to mean something even more as we start talking about this. Okay. Um. Da, 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 and when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Okay. Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. Right? So you wouldn't give something like that to somebody that's important who can make decisions in your life, who can help you out maybe in some way, or you may need their help some way in the future. You wouldn't do that for them, but you're going to do that for God Almighty, from whom all blessings flow. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's see what else God has to say about that. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you? 
says the Lord of hosts, Oh, that there are uh, that there were excuse me. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. So I'm going to make some application here. You know I am. That happens to us. Well, I shouldn't say it happens to us. I should say more accurately, that can happen to us. Because if we're not making good sacrifices and offering to God, then our worship is in vain. Go ahead, Jody. Imagine what David said when the man was going to give him the, the wood and the oxen for their sacrifice. David said, I will not offer that which cost me nothing. Because it didn't, it wasn't from him. It didn't cost me anything. It didn't mean anything to him. So yes. You give, you give the, the, the rejects of your herd. You're not really doing anything. And he says it's better not to offer anything right. than to offer the wrong. That's right. And it would be better if somebody had shut that door and stopped you. It would have been better for you. Okay, okay. <laughs> I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. What, what does that mean? What, what do they mean by what a weariness this is? They're just frustrated they got to do it. <laughs> say that again. They're frustrated because... We just have to do it. We got off the second we're, we're frustrated about it. We don't really want to. This right. Is, this is the, hard. The, say again? This is hard. The, this is hard. This is difficult. This, we are doing this not because, right. We're doing this because we have to. And not only are they doing this because they have to, but they're not even giving their best. They're not even giving their good. They're giving their worst. Okay. So, um, and you snort at it. Now, I like how the New King James says, it says you sneer at it. You sneer at sneer, sneer at the sacrifice. Sneer at the offering. What does that mean? What is that? Okay. Think of it like this. It's almost like they feel like they're getting away with something. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Here you go, God. Here you go. So I really I really took that to heart because I felt like it is something that it is something that that is a that is a pitfall for people to fall into. It's something that we have to watch out for. Yes. Don't feel like coming to church is going to is what it's all about. Yeah. Go ahead, Joey. People often said, "I got to go to church." Yeah. <laughs> right. I got to go to church. That concept. Thank you. I'm obligated, therefore I got to go. What a weariness this is. Okay. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Now you're talking about the already talking about the lame and the sick, but you but you bring what has been taken by violence? Is it that's not like that they're taking stuff that doesn't even belong to them? Is that what it sounds like? So not only is it stuff that they own that's the worst of what they own. But it's not even their own stuff. Okay. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Whew, okay. That was... So... Um, All right, so I cannot think of a clearer warning to all of us because even today, oh, how much time do I have? Okay, so even today, 
we sacrifice, do we not? I kind of hinted at it before. There are things that we do that are an offering to God. That's a sacrifice to God. So let's take a look at First uh, uh, Peter chapter two, verse five. Actually, I might start in verse four. So First uh, Peter chapter two, verses four through five. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what is this spiritual sacrifice that he's talking about? What would y'all consider to be some spiritual sacrifices? <coughs> yeah. Your worship. Worship. Okay, that's I've got that down. Your... And it's, it's an open-ended question. Okay, so uh, let, let me. Okay, let me read from Hebrews. Therefore, by him let us continually. I'm sorry. This is Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. Hebrews what, brother? Hebrews chapter 13. Verses 15 through 16. I'm cheating. I've got it on my computer so I don't have to flip through the pages. <laughs> okay. All right. So in Hebrews, therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Go ahead, Judge. Verse 12. What says, which is your reasonable service. Yeah. Which is your reasonable service. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I got barbecue sauce on my face. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, now that I've read that, can we name off some things that we do as Christians that are spiritual sacrifices? Offerings. I'm going to get us going. Meekness. Generosity. Your Mercy. Money. Go ahead. Your money. Your offering. Okay. Offerings. That's a biggie. Uh, but also generosity. Okay, yeah. Generosity. What about prayer? Say again. Prayer. Prayers. Prayers. Absolutely. Prayers. Mm -hmm. Our love of luxury. We all love luxury. We all love to... But sometimes we have to sacrifice some luxury in order to help out someone else. Time. Time. I cannot say how important that is because your time is literally your life. I know you're not supposed to say that word literally, but that's what it is. Your time is your life. When you give somebody your time, you're giving them your life. You're giving them a portion of your life. Brotherly love. What am I leaving out? Mercy. Uh, obedience. Obedience to God. <laughs> obedience to our... Uh, leaders, and that's a hard one sometimes. Forgiveness. Say again. Forgiveness. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely, forgiveness. And the one that I struggle with the most is holiness. Holiness. And I say that because that's the one where you're really guarding your mind, you're guarding your behavior, you're guarding your mouth, you're guarding. And, and how you treat other people, that that holiness is an offering to God. Okay, all right. Before I move on, does anybody have anything they want to add? Okay, um, but you profane it, and I think. Okay, so let's take a look at. Uh, I don't want to get too far. Okay, we got a few minutes left. Uh, look at chapter two. And now, O priest, the command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and will curse your blessings. Are we making uh, Where are we? Yeah, we're back in Malachi. I'm sorry. <laughs> Virginia, <laughs> that's my fault. Back in Malachi chapter 2. So, um, if you will not listen, oh, so 
the whole point on that was I want to stop there and, and, and have us just think about that a little bit because is that not something that happens to us even today? That, you know, that, that the things that, that we think are blessings, and they are blessings, they can actually turn into a curse for us yes. because our hearts have changed. Okay. Um, go ahead, Jody. Wait, wait. I'm, I'm going to let Dwayne speak because he hasn't spoken yet. Go ahead, Dwayne. I was just going to say that the Israelites, time again, over and over and over again, were blessed by God yes. to the extent to where they had a wonderful life. Yes, they did. And yet, all it took was a few years um, yes. or a, you know, older people, not teaching younger people, and the same thing happened again and again and again when they fell away from God. Right. And, I mean, literally, they had miracles back then. And yet they still somehow managed to mess it all up. Not just once, but time after time after time. And it, it, you're leading to a really good point, and I know it's... It's not directly related to what we were reading tonight, but you're reading to a really good point that, and I've heard preachers say this, that we're always one generation away yeah. from apostasy. Mm -hmm. And and that really that really does bear out throughout the, the Old Testament. And that is something that we definitely should keep in mind when we're raising our children and we're teaching the young generation and we're teaching new converts yeah. that, um, that that we keep that we keep out of apostasy. Jody, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's all right. It says, because they would not hear. A person not hearing is a person who doesn't apply himself to read, to study, and understand the Scripture. If you don't read and understand the Scripture, if you don't apply yourself, then you're going to go into whatever thing your heart leads you to, which is always evil. All right. Well, I wish I had my notes with me because I did have a couple of more points. But uh, um, I think we're going to go ahead and end it just a couple of minutes early unless anybody else wants to add something else before we, before we adjourn for the uh, devotional. Nothing else? Okay, well, thank you for putting up with me. And uh, hopefully... Have something else. Go ahead, Ms. Virginia. What's one scripture that comes to mind as we was talking about all this, right? As you all know, I love to make application. Yes, ma'am. I love to make application. I wouldn't have known that, but go ahead. <laughs> but I'm, 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 I'm looking, I remember the, uh, the scripture in Mark, the seventh chapter, uh, starting around about the sixth verse, where, where uh, if we are not careful, we can have the same attitude as the people back in Malachi does, where Jesus actually said, you know, uh, uh, Mark the seventh chapter and the sixth verse, uh, uh, and he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites? And it was written, this people honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, mm -hmm. teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. So we can come in here on Sunday morning, sit here, and worship God. And if we are not doing it with our heart, soul, right. and mind, it's in vain. It's in vain. We've wasted and when our time. I read that, I made sure I stepped up the pace. My mind is on Jesus. Now, now, don't walk out of here saying, Steve Warren said, if you don't feel like coming to church Sunday morning, don't come to church. I didn't say that. Okay? If you don't feel like it, fake it till you make it like a drill sergeant. Oh, that's bad. No. Come on in. Just get the attitude right. The attitude, it does matter what's going on inside your heart when you're praising God. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And that is all for tonight. All right.